Hi, and welcome to Code Tutorials. Today we'll take a look at how you can create an interactive display of your blog posts using the Blog Carousel widget from our key add-ons for Elementor plugin. Right now we're looking at some examples of this widget's use. On this page you'll find different possibilities for displaying your blog posts as sliders or carousels. And the advantage of this widget is that it lets you add a blog post showcase anywhere on your site. You're not limited to the blog archive page. Moreover, the blog carousel widget comes with several different layout and customization options, which you can combine in a multitude of ways. And this tutorial will show you what those options are and how to use them. So, let's get started. Head over to the back end, and in the Elementor sidebar, search for blog carousel. There it is. Now drag this over to the right. And this is what the widget looks like by default. We have three items with a predetermined layout. The navigation is enabled, you can see the arrows on the sides. And there's also pagination here at the bottom. But the posts shown in the carousel, well, you need to make those first. In the posts section of my WordPress dashboard, I have these three posts prepared. Those are the three you saw in the carousel. If you don't have any posts, there will be nothing for the carousel to show. So you first need to create posts and then you can start working with the blog carousel widget. Once you have your posts ready, you can set your carousel up. The first option is to enable the slider loop. It's set to yes by default and switching into no will keep the carousel from moving on a loop. Then we have the enable centered slides option. This one is set to no by default, but if enabled it will keep a slide always in the center of the carousel. It works in concert with this option, enable partial columns. I'll set it to yes and then use the slider to adjust how much of the columns on the sides will be visible. And then we have this partial view. With that set, I can enable centered slides to make the carousel symmetrical. And there, the partial view has been split between the sides and my carousel now has a slide always positioned in its center. Ok, I'll turn this off as I don't need it for my design. And I'll disable the partial column too. Done. Next, there's the enable slider rule to play. Keeping it set to yes allows the carousel to start moving as soon as the page loads. And below this we can adjust the slide duration. That's the amount of time that the slide is shown before being replaced by the next one. And we also have the slider animation duration for setting how long the animated effect that makes the single seem to slide will last. I'll keep the default values for both. Following that, we have the enable slider navigation option. By default, the navigation is enabled and we can see the arrows on the carousel sides. I'll leave them be and adjust their overlap with the slides later. Then we have the enable slider pagination option. Those are the three bullets at the bottom. I'll disable them since I already have the pagination arrows enabled and both might be too much at the same time. Next, we have the image proportions. This option lets us pick the size of the images in our slider. You can try these settings out to see which one you like best. For myself, I'll set original as the images I uploaded already have suitable proportions that will make them nice and uniform in the carousel. Next, we saw the enable partial columns option. So, moving on, we can pick the number of columns we want to have in our slider. 3 is the default, but you can switch that to any of these. Then, after that, we have the columns responsive option. Besides the predefined default, we can use custom settings. These let us manually adjust how many columns will be shown on each screen size. The first two settings are for laptop and MacBook screen widths. The setting for the widest desktop screens is made using the number of columns option above. So the first two I'll leave set as they are, but for all the rest I'll set one. There we go. Following this we have the space between items option. If you're displaying more than one column you can add a pixel value to adjust this space here between individual items. If you increase it you get something like this but you can just as easily decrease it. I'll set 28 pixels for my carousel. Alright. Our next section contains the query options. In here we can pick the number of posts per page. The name is somewhat misleading as this option lets you pick the maximum number of posts that will be shown in the carousel. Since I only have 3 posts, I'll set 3 for this. Even if I had more posts, this would limit the display to 3 at a time. 
Then we have the order by option for picking what criterion will be used for ordering the posts in the carousel. By default it's set to date, and I'm happy leaving it that way, but you can use any of these other settings such as ID or title. This is entirely down to your preference. Then we can pick the order in which the posts will be displayed. You can pick between the default descending or switch it to ascending. I'm going to leave it set to default. And below this we have the additional parameters. Using this option we can, in a way, filter the posts that will be shown in the carousel. The additional parameters allow us to choose whether we'll only show posts with certain IDs or certain taxonomy slugs or from certain authors. Although all my posts are shown here, I'll pick taxonomy slugs to demonstrate how the additional parameters option works. Now I can pick which taxonomy I want to use, a category or a tag. I'll use a category, but if you prefer you can opt for tags. And then in the field underneath, you type in the slug to specify the exact category or tag that should be shown. For me, that's going to be lifestyle. And finally, with the taxonomy IDs option, I can set which precise posts from the lifestyle category will be shown by adding their IDs. When you do that, you need to make sure to separate the ID numbers with a comma. This option is really useful if you have a lot of posts and want to highlight a few of them. Mind you, those posts need to belong to the category you already set or they won't be shown. As I said, this is almost like filtering the view. By the way, you can find the post's ID by looking at its URL. Let me show you. I'll open this one to demonstrate. Just a sec. Okay, now if we look at the URL here, this number is the post ID. So it's very easy to go through the posts you want to show, copy their IDs, return to the blog carousel element and note the numbers down in the taxonomy IDs field. Ok, that wraps up the query section. Now in the next section we have the item layout option. It's a handy one as it lets us pick how the items in the carousel will look. The default setting, boxed, is the one we see on the right, but you can change it to get a different look. For example, date boxed loses the clear distinction between the items in the carousel so they're not delineated. Then there is info on image, which gets us this compact look. Then we have side image, which would look much better with fewer columns. And finally there is standard, which looks like this. For my plan design I'll be using date boxed. Ok, now the option after this is for setting the title tag. Right now it's H5 and this is what the title looks like. For my design I'll switch this to H3. Ok, then we can choose whether we want to show the excerpt. By default it's there. It's this text. You can turn it off if you like, but I'll keep mine enabled. Next we can set the excerpt length. The default is 180 characters, but if I set 100 the text is significantly shorter. I'll clear this. Then we have the center content option. I'll switch it to yes so we can see. There, it centers the post's content. Since my design doesn't include this, I'll put it back. And with the show media option, we can disable the image display. Let me show you. If we switch this to no, the images disappear. But I want to restore mine. Ok. Next we have the show info icons for enabling icons next to the info text. This is the info text. And if I switch the setting here to yes, then we get these icons next to the text. Ok, I'll turn it back off. After that we have the option to show the date. It's enabled already by default. We can see the date here, but if I switch it to no, then the date disappears. I want to keep using mine so I'll put it back. Then we have the show category option. It's enabled by default so we can see lifetime here. But if you prefer, you can switch it off and then it will simply disappear from you. It's gone. I'll restore mine. Alright. And we also have the show author option. We can see it here. If you turn it off, it disappears. I'll leave it like this. Finally, the show button option allows us to display this button. You can turn it off and then the post will be opened by clicking on the title or featured image. Nevertheless, I want to keep mine on. If you do the same, you'll be able to use these options underneath to customize the button. Firstly, we can change the button text. It says read more by default unless you enter something new. That's what I'll do and set my button to say keep reading. Ok, 
Then we can choose the button layout. Filled is the one we see here. You can replace it with outlined, so you get this button look. Or you can set it to be textual, which looks like text. That's the one I'll use. And I'll enable a button text underline for it. So we have this line appearing under the button. OK, on to the next section. In here, we can add an icon to our button. You can upload an SVG or pick something from the icon library. I'm going to opt for the former as I've already uploaded a suitable SVG in my media library. And that's this arrow here, Insert Media. Then we have the option to pick if we want to switch it to the left or if it will stay to the right of the button text. I'll keep it like this. And the last section in the content tab is for the developer tools. When we open them, there is just one option here. Switching its setting to yes will get it to display the widget in the form of a standard WordPress shortcode, which we can easily copy for use elsewhere on our site. OK, now we can move on to the style tab. The topmost section here is the navigation style. In terms of options, the first one we have here is the navigation position. It determines where the navigation arrows will be. The default is inside, so the arrows are within the carousel. We can see them here. But there's also outside, which will move the arrows outside the bounds of the carousel, like so. And there's a third option on top of that, together. With that one, the arrows are at the bottom of the carousel next to one another. For my design, I'll be using the outside setting. Then, with high navigation, we can pick below which screen width the navigation arrows will stop being visible. For myself, I'll set it to below 768 pixels, which is the width of the portrait orientation on a tablet. Alright, after that, we have the navigation vertical offset. It lets us move the position of the arrows up or down. You can use the slider or type in a new value, whichever you prefer. And we have something similar for the horizontal offset. It lets us move the arrows left or right. I want to change the default value here, so I'll switch to percentages and type in 6.5%. OK, there we go. Nice and even. Following that, if you want to replace the default arrows used for the navigation, you have the next two options. Navigation arrow previous is this one here, and you can replace it with an icon from the library or an SVG. I'll use an SVG from my media library. OK, and then I'll do the same for the arrow next or the right arrow. I'll use another SVG, this one. Insert media. All right. So, once you've picked what icons you'll be using for your navigation, you can customize them further. Here we have settings for the normal icon display and the icon display on hover. So you can make your icon look different when hovered over. Now, under the normal settings, we have the color option, which you can use to easily change the icon's color. Simply pick whatever shade you like. Then, we have another color option. This one is for the arrow background. I'll keep it for the moment so I can show you the next few options. The navigation arrow size lets us increase the size of the arrows. Then the navigation arrow holder width lets us adjust the width of the space containing the arrow. And the navigation arrow holder height lets us do the same for the height of that space. And because I kept the color, we can see how the space has changed. Since it's done its job, I'll clear it. OK, and reset these options. Just a sec. There. That leaves me with the size, which I want to increase to 40 pixels. Perfect. With that, we can move on to the hover settings. The navigation arrow hover color lets us change the color on hover. There. It can be something like this. Then the navigation arrow background hover color allows us to change the background color on hover. Quite straightforward. And finally, we have the enable hover arrow move. It gets us this animated movement when we hover. But if we switch it to no, then there will be no arrow movement on hover. OK, I'll put this back. So I can keep this animation. All right. With that done, we can move on to the slider pagination style. And we can see it's empty. To get the options to show, I need to enable the pagination first. Give me a sec. Yes. OK. And that got us these pagination bullets here. All right. Let's go back to the style tab to see what we can do with the pagination. So, for starters, we can change the pagination position. It can stay on the inside or it can be on the outside of the carousel. I'm going to keep it on the outside so we can see the effect of the options better. 
With the pagination offset, we can move the pagination further away from the slider. Then, with the settings under normal, we can change the pagination color to any shade imaginable. And under active, we can set the pagination active color, which would show on the bullet that's connected to the currently active slide. Then, back to normal, we have the border type option for framing the pagination bullets. Please note, you need to set the type, width, and color for your border to appear. And then you'd get something like this around the bullets. Okay, let me reset this. Next, we have the pagination size option, which is very straightforward. And we have the space between bullets if we want to spread them out. And that's that for the pagination. I'll disable it again as it's not part of my plan design. No? Alright. Now I can carry on with the rest of the style tab options. And the next section is aptly named style. It contains options that will allow us to adjust different aspects of our title, info text, excerpt, and so on. The first option here is for changing the title color. This is the title, and you'd use this familiar color picker if you want to change its color. Then we have the title hover color option, so you can set a color that would appear on hover only, like so. Following that, we have the title typography settings. With them, you can pick things like the font family for the title. You have a wide selection of fonts. Then there's the font size, which can be in pixels, ams, rams, or the viewport width. And we can also adjust the font weight by picking any of these values. Then we have the option to transform the title to any of these, such as uppercase, for example. Following that, there's the style option if we want to change the title to something like italic. And using the decoration option, we can add a line under, over, or through the title. And after that, we have the options for adjusting the line height and letter spacing. And that's it. Next, we have the title hover underline. If we enable this, then hovering over the title will cause an animated line to appear, which looks like this. OK, I'll turn it off. Now we have the excerpt color. To change the color of this text here, and accompanying it, we also have the excerpt typography. It contains all the same options we saw in the title typography, so there's no need to go over them again. And next we have the info color. It's for adjusting the color of this text. It has this familiar color picker, which I'll use to set a hex code for plain black. There. And you can set a different color for the info on hover if you like. Depending on the color, it would look something like this. There is also the typography options for the info text, which I'll use to increase the font size to 16 pixels, and adjust the weight to 500. OK, that's all I wanted here. The next option is the image hover. That's the effect we get when hovering over an image. By default, it's set to zoom in, and the zoom origin is set to center. You can change that and select top, which looks like this, or bottom, which gets us this. Then there's left, that's this look, and finally right, which creates this effect. Now you can use all these zoom origin settings with the zoom out image hover effect as well. So something like this. There are other settings too, which have nothing to do with the zoom origin. Move is one, it looks like this. And the second one is none, with that one there's no change on hover. I'll use the original setting, zoom in, and the default zoom origin, center. OK. After this, we have the overlay color option. With it, you can set the color, then give it a degree of transparency, and there. The images are overlaid with your chosen color. Other than this, we have the overlay hover color. It works the same, so you set the color, like so, and then you adjust the transparency to keep the image visible. Alright, that's it for the style section. Then, in the Layout Spacing Style section, we have options like the Post Info Margin button. This lets us add more space under the information text. Here, you can drag the slider to adjust the space or type in a value. I'll set 7 pixels for it. Then, we can adjust the Title Margin button. That's for adjusting the space between the title and the excerpt. You can see it change here. For that one, I'll set 15 pixels. Then we can adjust the space here, under the image, using the image margin bottom option. You can see how the space changes as I drag the slider. I'll leave it at 
33 pixels. Okay. And finally, we have the text margin bottom option. This one lets us add space under the excerpt, like so. For this space, I'll set 31 pixels. Alright, that's all we had in the layout spacing style section. In the next one, the read more button style section, we can style the button. This one that, as I changed it, says keep reading. So, in this section, the first thing we can adjust is the typography settings. Since we're already familiar with them, I'll just quickly increase the font size to 17 pixels, OK, and we can move on. Then we have these switches, normal and hover. Each reveals different options. Under normal, we have the text color option. With it, we can easily change the color of the button text. I'll set the hex code for a very dark gray here. OK. Then there are these options starting with the background color, which won't work for me. That's because the button layout I'm using is textual and it has no background, unlike the filled and outlined layouts. And that's also why the border option, starting with the border color, won't work for me now. So I can safely skip over to the hover settings. The first thing in here is the text hover color. Much like the one under normal, this lets us change the color of the button text. But this one is only visible on hover. Other than this option, the others won't work for me because of my chosen button layout. So this brings us to the read more button icon style section. If you added an icon to your button, this is where you can adjust it, starting with its size. For this, I'll set 6 pixels. OK. Below that, we have the option to change the icon color. It works like setting any other color. And under hover, we have the move icon option. It lets us pick the animation the icon will have when hovered over. This is horizontal short, but there's also horizontal. It looks like this. Or you can pick vertical, which looks like this. Then there's the diagonal setting with this look. And finally, you can set this to none to keep the icon stationary on hover. For my button, I'll keep the horizontal short animation. This one. All right. After this, we have the icon margin option. If I start to increase the values, we can see how the space around the icon increases. I'll clear this since I don't need the same amount of space on all sides and delink the fields, which will let me adjust each side separately. Then I can put 3 pixels at the top and 10 pixels on the left, and that is all. I'm happy with this look. Which brings us to the next section, the read more button inner border style. When we open it, we can see it's empty. This is because the settings here are meant to apply to a button with an inner border. Since that's not possible with my chosen button layout, this is empty. So moving on to the read more button underline style section, I do get options here as I enabled the button text underline earlier. So now I can customize it by changing the underline color, for example. There's this familiar color picker to help us set a new color for it. Then we can adjust the underline width. You can determine how long the line will be if you don't want it to be as long as the button text. And with underline thickness, you can set how thick the line will be, like so. Alongside these, we have the underline alignment. And this works when your underline is shorter than the button text. Then you can move it to the right or set it to be in the center. I'll reset this. And the thickness and width too. Then we can look at the underline offset. This is for adjusting the amount of space between the underline and the button text. This here. The higher the value you set, the closer the line will be. I'm going to leave this set at 6 pixels. OK. Now, for the hover settings with the underline hover color option, we can set a new color for the underline which will appear on hover. And with underline hover width, we can shorten or lengthen the line that's displayed on hover. All right, I'll clear this. The final option here is the Enable Hover Underline Draw. When enabled, it creates a slight animated effect that makes it seem like the underline is being drawn when you hover over it. This is what it looks like. I'll turn this off. It's not part of my planned design. OK, the default look is back. After this, our next section is Content Style. I'll circle back to it later as the options here become available if you opt to use a specific layout for your blog carousel items. For now, let's look at the date style. In this section, we have the options for adjusting the look of the date here. So the first thing we can do is change its color. We can see how it changes when we look at the boxes at the top. 
Then we have the date hover color. So that's the color that appears only on hover, as we can see here. Next, there's the date typography. As we already covered these options, I'll just change the font size to 15 pixels. Okay, that's it. Then we have the background color option. So that's for changing the color of the box holding the date. For this, I'll set a very dark gray as the background. And finally, we have the date padding option. Increasing the values here will create more space around the date itself. We can see the date container get bigger because of this. I'll clear the values and delink the field so I can set different values for different sides. And those will be 9 pixels at the top, 16 on the right, 9 at the bottom, and 16 on the left. And I'm done. Let me hit update. This is the result I was going for. My block carousel perfectly reflects the design that I plan to use. I'm happy with the finished look. But before we part, I promise to show you the content style options. As I mentioned, to use these you need to have a specific item layout. So to get the options I need to temporarily change my layout. And the one that you can use to get the options is the boxed item layout. This is what it looks like. And with it, when I go back to the content style section, we can see some options here. The first is for setting the content background color. It's a simple color change that's reflected on the boxes containing the post singles. And the second is for setting an item shadow. Just clicking on the option adds the shadow. Then you can adjust it. We have its horizontal offset and its vertical offset. The blur shadow setting and the option for shadow spread. Finally, there is position, which can set the shadow within the box rather than outside it. And that's it. These are the content style options you get if you opt for the boxed item layout. Now I'll go back and restore the layout that's in line with my intended design. And you know, whichever one of these you choose to use is down to your preferences and what you want to do with your carousel design. For myself, I want to go back to what I had before we looked at the content style options and that is date boxed. There. Update. And this is my finished blog carousel. As we wrap up this tutorial, let's take one last look at the page we started from. The one with examples of different blog carousel designs you can make with this widget. With all the explanations in this tutorial and having learned which options you have in the back end, as well as how to use them, you should now be able to make your own blog carousel elements easily. You can take the examples you see here and copy them for your site, or simply use them as inspiration. Also, you can just as easily create something unique by making different combinations of settings. This is the design I chose to mirror, but how you decide to use and stylize this widget is entirely up to you. Hopefully, you found this tutorial helpful and will be creating your own blog post displays with the key add-ons for Elemental plugin and its blog carousel widget shortly. And if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions, please drop us a line in the comments below. Also, make sure to subscribe to our channel and be the first to learn about new theme guides and tutorials. Thanks for watching.